Welcome to your iconic image. If you want to take control of your image and be a power player in your space, then this is the show for you. Here we will arm you with tools and information to help you grow your brand on purpose. I'm your host, Marlena Semenza, photographer and visual strategist. Now let's dive into today's episode. Andrew Ryder is a writer and entrepreneur who is reimagining content creation for online educators so that they can highlight their uniqueness and build relationships with their audiences. Welcome, Andrew. Hey, Marlana. Thanks so much for having me. So that's really the key, isn't it, about building relationships with our audience? Because I know if we are entrepreneurs and we are creating content, it's really marketing at its core. And so in the mix there, we have to come up with ideas. We have to come up with ideas and create content that people actually want to consume and still promote ourselves because we are a business all in a way without feeling icky. So, so the question is, I'm going to hit you with it all at once. How do we do it? Is it, is it different things or is it all kind of woven into the same thing? For me, it's all woven into the same thing. And, you know, perhaps the place to start is in defining what content is. A lot of people think that it's the first thing that comes to mind would be your social media or your blog, or maybe even your email list. I also include any paid content you create, courses, coaching. It's, It's really any way that you're communicating with your customer or your audience or with people who you want to be in your audience. It's going to be the stories that you tell. It's going to be the analogies that you use at any, at any scale, right? If you're doing a social media post, you want to use some kind of analogy or story to, to teach a lesson, right? But you can still use those same analogies and stories to make a breakthrough in a one-on-one call with a private client. So everything that you do, even down to the color schemes and the graphics and the way that you present your website is content that your audience or your prospective audience is consuming, right? They're going to your website. They're looking at the services you provide, the things that you do, the language that you use, and they're comparing that to a competitor or to a a software solution that claims to solve their problems, right? And, And so when we touch on the idea of creating content that builds relationships, at the end of the day, that's what it comes down to is your, your prospect, your customer is looking at all of these different potential solutions and they're going to go with whatever the person who they trust the most says to do. So if they just came across you, they don't really know anything about you. They've probably been burned in the past. They've made mistakes. They've bought things that aren't what they seem to be. They've gotten ripped off. You know, everybody's gotten ripped off by a sleazy online marketer. (laughs) That's just the reality of of the market that we're we're in today. So if you build trust with them through your content and you say, hey, you know, I know you've gone through all these problems. You've had all these issues. Here's what worked for me. I, you know, overcame this personally. I had all these issues. I figured out how to solve it. And I want to share that with you. If they trust you, they're going to go with your recommendation, even if it's more expensive, even if it's harder, they're going to go with with what you uh, recommend to them rather than going with something that they don't trust or they don't fully understand. Mm. So there's, there's, you know, there's really a big, there's an immense value in creating trust in your marketing. And I think it's, you know, it's becoming a necessity in the climate that we're in. But I think where people get caught up is content creation is such a, it's such an interesting aspect of what we do in business, because if you're sitting down to write every, every day, or every time you sit down to write, you're confronting the limitations of, of your knowledge, the limitations of your understanding and writing is sort of, it's, I have a love hate relationship with it because some days I really hate it because it's just showing me how limited my understanding is and I can't get the right words together. And I just keep thinking, you know, this is not the high enough quality for what I like to produce, what, you know, my standards are. And on the other side, it's fun and you just start pulling together ideas and you get into a flow state and just have this amazing experience and you create something super valuable for your audience. 
But if you don't structure it in the right way, you end up spending most of your time just sitting there staring at a blank page, right? You're trying to get some momentum. You're trying to force yourself through it, but there's all these hurdles that, that come in. You maybe get a couple sentences and you think, you know, no, this, this isn't the right, you know, this isn't the problem that my audience really struggles with. I'm not using the right language in, in this. I'm not speaking to their problems. And it, it, you quickly get into this place where you take it out on yourself and you think I'm not a good writer. I don't have what it takes maybe I'm not cut out for this business thing after all. I, those are all thoughts that I've had personally and had a lot. And the solution that I found to all of that was getting away from what I would call traditional content creation advice, which is a lot of content calendars. It's a lot of templates and swipe files and, and things that are designed to make content creation easy but they end up just making it complicated and making it harder. Um, there's this sort of four quadrant um, exercise that you can do. And basically you're putting on one axis, you're putting how hard is it? Is it, you know, the spectrum goes from easy to hard, right? And then the other axis that you're comparing against is ranging from simple to complex. And so on, on you know, one end of the spectrum, you're going to have hard and complex things. Those are probably not things that you want to be doing in, in your business. <laughs> or, you know, maybe you want to find a way to take something that's hard and complex and develop a solution that's easy and simple, right? So how can you make things easier? How can you make things simpler? But not everything moves in that direction. I have found personally that a lot of content creation advice, templates, content calendars, those types of things they try to make it easier, but they end up making it more complicated with having to keep track of a bunch of things. And you end up writing things that don't really sound like your voice or you're using headlines or calls to action that are, they're supposed to be high converting or they're supposed to build a better relationship with your audience, but they feel canned. They feel kind of salesy. You know, a lot of those things, I would be writing these things and thinking to myself, you know, this, this isn't me, this there's, there's no way that this is like, I don't believe these things that I'm saying. I'm just doing them because that's supposed to feel like that's supposed to be the best way to do it or the highest converting way to do it. And I think that's where a lot of people really get that, that feeling of ickiness or being salesy or inauthentic in their content is they're trying to do what they think is the quote unquote right thing to do, but they're not doing the right thing for them. Hmm. And I think that's a really important distinction to make. And, and so that's really where I help specifically coaches and course creators. Uh, those are the folks that I'm really passionate about helping to, like you said, connect to their uniqueness and to tell stories and to create content that's really authentic because ultimately that authenticity is what's going to drive that relationship. It's what's going to build the trust that then makes the sale, makes it so much easier too. So if we are, let's say, writing our own content, how do we get past the dreaded blank page? I believe that there's more than enough ideas in your life to have an unending supply of content. There's really two places where a lot of people get hung up. The first is in lacking momentum. So if you are producing content every single day, if you are writing, if you are interacting with your audience and you are you know, actively looking for ideas, you're going to generate more and more ideas just through the act of sitting there and writing and thinking and taking that time to do it. It's difficult to explain uh, in sort of a scientific sense, but I just find personally that the way I structure my morning routine is, um, is very specific to try to get me first thing in the morning before I start introducing social media, before I start checking email, before I introduce my mind to other people's thoughts and other people's hopes and dreams and desires for me. I want to wake up and, you know, over the course of sleeping that night, my brain has made a whole bunch of new connections. I've processed all the information from the previous day. I want to take that and I just want to start writing and get into a flow state where 
I'm just generating ideas and making connections between different things and discovering what happened in my brain over the last, you know, 24 hours. And I, th I think, so the first thing to do, if you're struggling to come up with ideas is to make sure you're structuring your time in a way to where you give yourself the freedom to explore things that you may not, may not know that, you know, connections that you may not know that you've made in your brain over the last, you know, over the course of sleeping. And there's a lot of neuro neuroscience that particularly being done at, at Stanford that backs up a lot of these things. Uh, Andrew Huberman in, in particular is a researcher, a doctor there at Stanford, who's doing a lot of this stuff, not just for the side of, of content creation, but he's really interested in peak performance. And there's a huge link between performing well, you know, your nutrition, your sleep, your exercise, your ability to focus, and then being able to sit down for an hour or however long you take to write and to create something, you, you know, your ability to focus has a huge impact on your ability to create new things. You know, it's interesting that you say that you get up in the morning and you write, because I remember reading a book years ago called The Artist's Way, and that's what they recommended was before you do anything, before you, you have a sip of coffee, write, just write for 10 solid minutes. And they said, in doing that every day, you will start to see themes and patterns develop. And, you know, we could always use those to help do what you're saying. Yeah, that's, um, that's interesting. And I think that, um, you know, for me, I do a couple of other things before I, I jump into writing, but there's also a, so it's going to depend on your circadian rhythm. And there are quizzes that you can take if you don't know what, basically your circadian rhythm is your internal clock. So it's going to tell you, okay, it's five o'clock in the morning, it's time to wake up. Or maybe it's going to tell you, okay, it's 11 a.m., it's time to wake up. And depending on your own individual circadian clock, you know, some are longer than 24 hours, which means you're going to end up generally sleeping in and staying up later. Some are shorter than 24 hours, which means you'll be an early riser. You'll get up and you do your most productive work first thing in the morning. So, you know, a lot, one thing that I say all the time is you, you really have to know yourself and you have to know your strengths and your weaknesses. If you are a night owl type of person, you'll be much better off creating your content later in the day. You know, I know a lot of people who have written their, their books between like midnight and 3 a.m. is when they do all their writing. And to me, that's just unthinkable. You know, I do, I'm the opposite. I do my writing from like six to nine in the morning. <laughs> and that's, you know, that's the best time for me to think and to focus. So there's, there's free quizzes out there where you can take, uh, figure out what your circadian rhythm is. And there's sort of a, I think a lot of people may think that they are lean more towards the night owl side of things, you know, later side of things because of other factors that influence their energy. And, you know, if you just are sort of lazy and you just let yourself sleep in, you're going to start to push your schedule back and, and go later into the day. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's the optimal condition for you to work in. So even if you think that you are a morning person or a night person, uh, you know, it'd be, it'd be valuable to take one of those quizzes. And like I say, you can just Google it and find a whole bunch of them um, and see what they say and see how it compares to your own experience. And, and maybe you try different routines to see what works best for you. Mm. Okay. So now let's say we have some content. We think it's great. How do we, because at the end of the day, it, it's fine that we think it's great, but what matters more is that our audience thinks it's great. So how do we bridge that gap? I think it's a combination of iteration and just prolific publishing. Um, and by, by that, I mean, for me, it's an email every single day. The more that you can create content, the faster you're going to learn. You know, no one's going to create a perfect article or blog post or social media post every time. Most of the time, it's going to be average, right? It's going to be okay. It's going to help a couple of people that, you know, maybe are longtime fans, they read all your stuff, but the reality is a good percentage of your content is going to fall flat. 
And so it's about you know, how can I get through and find the best articles, right? It, it, you create something that you like, you post it, and it's like, it's okay. It gets a little bit of crickets. response. <laughs> yeah, or it gets crickets, right? That's going to happen. And the key is to just keep publishing because then you're going to find something that gets above average response. And you're like, wow, okay, that's an interesting idea. How can I expand on this? What are the comments saying? What can I do to improve this? And then you're going to get, you know, every once in a while, you're going to get one that just goes crazy and everybody loves it. And you look at that and you think, okay, what are the key points here? What is the language that I'm using? What can I take from this piece of content? And how can I expand that into, or, or expand that piece of content into sub articles? Or how can I expand it into a, a book or combine it with something else that I've written that also did well and, you know, make a longer form blog post or something like that. So that's where the iteration side of things comes in is the more you do it, the more data you get, the more feedback you get from, from your audience or from uh, social media or, or wherever you're publishing, that's going to tell you what people are interested in. And you can sort of follow that path and continue to expand on what's working and cutting back on what's not working. The, I guess, there's a word of caution there, though, that I would give is that the greatest visionaries in our lifetimes have ignored, predominantly ignored market feedback. If you look at someone like a Steve Jobs, uh, he didn't say, you know, how can I create a way to listen to a CD on, you know, your, the, you know, how can I create the next, um, CD-ROM, you know, player, Walkman. I was, couldn't think of the word. <laughs> um, he didn't try to create a better cassette, right? He wanted to have every single song that you would ever want to listen to on a small enough device that could go into your pocket. And so he didn't, he didn't set out to improve what already existed. He set out to create something completely new, something that then when he goes to, you know, he creates the iPod and he goes to, to sell it, he says, hey, look, you don't know that you want this, but this is going to change the way that you experience life because you're going to have every single song that you've ever wanted to listen to you, uh, listen to with you in your pocket while you're cooking, while you're doing laundry, while you're driving in your car, while you're doing anything in your life, you're going for a run or you're working out, you can always have that perfect song ready to go. And he convinced that, you know, everyone was like, yeah, you're right. I don't want another Walkman or a bigger CD carrier. I want an iPod. The same can be said for Henry Ford. You know, the famous quote, he says, if I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse, but he didn't want to give people what they wanted. He wanted to give them what they needed, which was a safer, faster way to travel, right? He created, you know, a way to make the automobile widespread and you know that changes the course of of history so, so let me let me just jump in yeah a second. So <laughs> let's say that we have a product or we have a service and we are convinced about that product or service yet other people it's new to other people how do we effectively communicate that in a way that they will understand its value so this really comes back to leadership, which I would separate into basically three different baskets. It's demonstration. It's um, what I would call leading by example. So you are going and you are implementing your system, your solution, and you're really just communicating back to back to your audience or to others. Yeah, and you can take this, you know, you can go get interviews on podcasts and talk about it. You can go get magazine articles written about you, or you can do whatever kind of press or publicity that you want to share this, but really just documenting the results that you're getting and the lessons that you're learning as you develop this system. And, you know, that comes back to all the things we're talking about, the content creation, the, the market research and the, the feedback you're getting is definitely important. You know, don't get me wrong. You want to take that into consideration, but you don't want to just give them, you know, a, a better Walkman or a bigger CD carrier, right? You want to create something completely new. The other 
aspect of leadership that I would say is your ability to cast a vision and to really show your customer what their life looks like, how it's different, how it's better, how it's easier, you know, all of these things. What does that look like if they're to take the leap with you? And, and what are the intricacies of your product or your service that allow them to get this result that they want in a better way or an easier way? Uh, you know, for a lot of, this is sort of easier for software and for physical products, right? Because it's easy for me to take an, uh, an iPod out of my back pocket and say, hey, look, I've got 1500 songs on this device. And everyone's like, wow, okay, that makes perfect sense. Uh, how can I get one? With information products, it's, it's more difficult. It's, um, it's a lot more of storytelling. It's a lot more of of marketing and content creation that has to go into the to building that world that is that destination that they want does that um does that make sense the way i've mm -hmm. described it it does it does so as we take people on this journey and, and we're creating our content and things like that how how much do we need to put out there before we can ask something of them? You know what I mean? So in, in the whole marketing scheme so of things. Where do you where do you make your sales pitch? Is that kind mm. of the <laughs> angle you're getting at? Um, you know, there's sort of the common example that would be if you went to the hospital and they said, sorry, you know, or you have a broken arm or something, you got in a car accident, you go to the hospital and they say, sorry, we only have information day. So we're going to give you tips about how to shower with your cast on or how do you avoid getting in a car accident, but we're not actually providing any services today, right? That would be, that would be really, really unfortunate. <laughs> that would ruin your day. And they would end up going to a different hospital to get the surgery or get the help that they need. And, and that's sort of the argument to say that you should be putting a call to action of some kind in every piece of content that you create. Hmm. There's the whole spectrum. You know, there's people who just create content and don't have any calls to action. Maybe they say, hey, reply to this email. Let me know what you think. I uh, would love to hear your thoughts on this or answer a question. And then they build up to eventually they have a launch for their course or their program or something like that. And they have sort of a, a more hard call to action in those where it's like, Hey, click this button, go to this website, buy this product, uh, sign up for this phone call consultation. It really is going to depend on how much, how many different things you have to sell. If you have 10 different programs, or let's say you have 12 different programs, you can sell one different thing each month and you can rotate through them. And then in between those, you can have different calls to action. Maybe you open up a private coaching spot. So you can throw in a couple of days where you talk about that. Maybe you have a, um, a book that you wrote. So you can mention that a couple of times or a continuity program. So the more products you have, the more ability you have to rotate through different offers, different weeks or months and keep things. See, there's sort of a balance between consistency and inconsistency. You want to be creating consistent content and you want to consistently call them to action, but you want to rotate and you, you want them to wonder what you're going to offer them and what, how you're going to, to position it and what kind of story you're going to tell or what tips you're going to give. So you keep them on edge. So they're always curious to see and to open your content or read your emails to see what it is that you have to offer today or where you're going to go with it. But, you know, you want to be doing it consistently. If you only mail once a month, or you only post on social media once a month, they're going to forget about you and they're never going to open any of your stuff. So I lean more towards the daily, daily creation, daily calls to action. And most of the time, I'm pitching, uh, you know, and I say it as a pitch. It's not really a pitch. There's this, um, this line that I love from Ben Settle, who's really the, the top tier 
of email marketing. And he says that you, you don't want to sell people things. You want to invite them to join you. And so mm -hmm. the way that looks in a call to action, and, and really this is at the core of what I teach is instead of just shilling your stuff, you know, Hey, you should buy this. It's going to expire tomorrow. And you're going to get, you're going to make a million dollars this month. But if you, you know, don't sign up before the end of the week, you miss out on, you know, all these bonuses or, or whatever. The world's going to blow up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's not, um, it's not a hard call to action. It's, it's really soft. You know, I just say, I tell generally tell a story. I, tell the moral of that story, which is usually something directly related to their ability to create better content or to improve their business or mindset or something that's going to directly help them in their business. And then I say, you know, Hey, by the way, I wrote an entire chapter of my book about this. And if you want to go in depth, you can go, you know, to this link and buy my book and, and learn more. And so that's is it kind of, is it kind of like a serve don't sell kind of outlook? Yeah, uh, I would, you know, serve is an interesting word. Uh, I'm not sure that I've used it in that context. Um, but I would say service is a really important word in my vocabulary and, and can talk about that maybe in a minute. But yeah, I would say, you know, serve, don't sell, but just offer them the opportunity, right? You know, mm -hmm. the hospital isn't running around trying to, you know, purposefully make car accidents so they can get more customers, right? They're just there. And if you need them, it's an opportunity. Hey, we can get you a cast for your broken arm. We can help you with all of these different issues. If you need us, we are located at this address. It's so it's a really soft call to action, right? And if you need the hospital, you, you go, if you need to dive deeper in learning how to tell better morals for your stories, how to connect random things that are happening in your life to whatever you teach. Well, maybe you want to read this chapter uh, in my book that's going to show you how to do it. Mm -hmm. And and if you don't want to read it, no big deal. Right. <laughs> no hard feelings. Um, that's you know perfectly fine. So it, it can be really just a soft invitation. And over the course of years or, or, or months or weeks or however long you keep sharing these things with your audience, you know, eventually you're going to find that right message, right? We talked about iteration and, and learning and improving. You're going to find that message that there, there's sort of this light bulb moment in your customer's mind where they think, oh, like I never understood what this actually did until you phrased it like that. Mm -hmm. And now I want to take this opportunity to buy your ebook or to invest in your coaching program or, or whatever it is. So it, it, you know, we've kind of come, I guess, full circle there back to the market research and to really iterating on your messaging. And, and the more that you're creating content, the more that you're putting out those soft calls to action, because you don't know, like I, like I said before, you don't know which one is really going to connect with them. So you always want to give them the opportunity to, take the next step if they're ready for it. And because you brought it up now, I have to ask, what does service mean to you? So I, you know, I'm a nerd about these kinds of things. So I like words that have multiple meanings. So service is the like products and services that you provide, right? And there's this Seth Godin example that I come back to where he's talking about trying to hang a picture on the wall and you, maybe you don't have, you have a hammer, but you don't have nails. So you have to go to the hardware store to get an, a nail, right? But you don't really need a nail. You need something to hang this picture on, but you don't really need to hang the picture. What you need is to see your family and to feel in loving connection with them and feel the joy that you feel when you see that picture on the wall. And so when you think, you know, when you take those steps backwards, every product is a service. It's providing some utility, some service to your customer. So that's, that's sort of one definition of service. The other definition of service is customer service. It's how you show up and how you deliver it and all of the things that go into creating that experience for your customer that ultimately, you know, with the word service, they're very, very close together, but two unique 
definitions. And I think it's, it's easy to get caught up in how do I create this offer, right? How do I create this service that has all of these bonuses and all of these things that we forget about the other aspect of service, which is how am I serving my customer in a way that best suits their needs? Mm. Love it. So I really like service. I also like content and I also like fulfillment. Those are the three that I've, that I've come up with. So content is things that you create, uh, right. We've been talking about a lot of content, but it's also content. You know, are you content with the systems and processes and the way that you're creating content? Are you content with the pitches that you're making? Are you feeling icky about it? Or are you, you know, are you content? Are you happy with it? Fulfillment is close to service, right? It's, it's um, how you fulfill your products and services, but it's also the fulfillment that you get from you know, creating another happy customer, or it's the fulfillment that they get from overcoming and achieving their goals and, and really solving their problems. Mm, love so it. I like those little word things. I kind of have a, a running list in my mind. And so when I, when I see those, uh, I definitely take, take note of them because I think it's, it's not on accident that those words are so closely linked. Mm. So if, if somebody gets nothing else from this episode, what would you like them to take away from it? You know, I think that the most important step to improving your content is going to be, can be more consistent with it. There are so many things that can derail you, whether it's just life stuff comes up, whether it's negative self-talk as you, you get halfway through a post and you don't like where you're going and you start to convince yourself that you're not any good at this or you're, you're, you know, your audience, it doesn't matter because your audience isn't going to respond favorably anyway. You know, nobody's listening to your content on social media, whatever excuse, whatever, you know, that little voice in the back of your head, that's trying to get you to stop or not to not put yourself out there. The best way to get around that is to just keep going and don't give yourself the option. Just publish as consistently as you can. That is going to, it's going to help you create better ideas. It's going to improve your writing. It's going to improve your ability to get that feedback and iterate on the types of content that you're creating. It's going to make everything else that you do better. So I would be looking for not just in content creation, but other ways that you can be just ruthlessly consistent. How can you do the same thing every single day and continue to get better and better returns from it mm -hmm. over time? It's like compounding interest, right? You invest your money in a index fund or something and it continues to compound and grow and grow and grow. And we've all seen those exponential charts, right? But where, you know, where in your business, where in your life can you invest in things that just continue to get better and better the more that you do it? Love it. And with that, Andrew, I just have four final questions for you. First one is what's the best piece of advice you were ever given? I think the best advice, you know, and this is going to go hand in hand with what we just were talking about with consistency. Um, but this is an advice that I was directly given, but it's just a lesson that I saw my dad doing and I saw, I don't know if it was consciously or subconsciously, maybe I just wanted to be more like him, but he's always been the most consistent person that I've ever seen with everything that he does with his workouts and with, you know, studying and learning and working and improving in his life. And I always saw, I guess, you know, how smart he is and dedicated he is. And I wanted to be more like that. And so that lesson of consistency was something that's been instilled in me, not through a direct sit down, Hey, this is the best advice I can give you. But just by watching him, yeah, like we talked about, you know, he was leading by example. Mm -hmm. And I saw that demonstration over the years. And that has been the, the biggest lesson for me to be consistent in my own life is just watching him, you know, getting out there and getting a workout in the rain and in the cold and in the sunshine and doesn't matter. There's no question about it. He's going to go get it done. Uh, so it, inspiration and motivation for me to, to be as consistent as him. That's great. Share with us one thing on your bucket list. I, I would really like to do 
one of those Mediterranean cruises. Mm. Uh, you know, they, they take you all around to all these different um, ports around the Mediterranean Sea, and you get to see a whole bunch of cool history. And I've never been to Europe personally, so I would, you know, I'd really love to go. And I think that would be the, a good first way, first exposure. You get exposure to a lot of different places, a lot of different things. And, um, you know, we get some good weather, get to hang out on the cruise ship. Although it seems, you know, this has been on my bucket list for a long time. And I'm not sure how I feel about cruise ships right now, but hopefully someday in the future, uh, there'll be a better opportunity to uh, take that Mediterranean cruise or just go explore Europe. You know, it's, it's a place that would take a lifetime to fully explore. Um, and I'd like to see some of those cool and interesting things that they have to offer. So as somebody that writes, it doesn't surprise me that you want to travel because it, there is such a close link to travel and being able to tell stories and write. Yeah, it, definitely. And it's, um, you know, there's such rich history that you can draw on to, you know, just let your imagination go wild, but there's also being exposed to new things and new ideas really opens your mind up and it changes your mind so that you're open to new experiences. And that really helps your creativity and your storytelling, like you said. And, um, I, I never really thought about it in that making that connection, but yeah, you're definitely right. So when the toy companies finally get around to making an action figure of you, what two accessories will it come with? I thought about this question a lot because I didn't initially have a good answer for you. Uh, you know, I, the first thing that came to mind, funny enough, was a cell phone because I just feel so like everyone is so connected to their phone. That's the number one accessory that we all use all the time, right? Is our, is our phone. And so much so that, so that it's not even really an accessory anymore. It's part of who we are. It's another limb. Um, <laughs> and yeah, exactly. And maybe it's because I've been trying to sort of sever that uh, bond a little bit, trying to put my phone in and really intentionally use my phone instead of my phone using me. But I, I think the, the better answer that I came to was going to be um, a lightsaber. So I was a huge Star Wars fan uh, growing up. And, you know, in my childhood, the um, episodes one, two and three came out. And I was just so into Star Wars. And I remember unboxing the action figures and they had the little lightsaber accessories. And um, as kids, you know, we would play with all the Star Wars Legos and we would um, build them together and use the, the out of the box Legos. But then we would eventually take them apart and build new things and created our own worlds with all of these different Star Wars toys and things. And, and that had a, a huge impact on my life. But I think it's also sort of symbolic in, you know, the lightsaber is an interesting tool because it casts, you know, you turn it on and it lights up the darkness. And it's also, you know, you can basically cut through anything. Mm -hmm. And I see, I see a lot of symbology in the work that I'm trying to do and the work that I'm trying to help other people do with those two analogies, right? So I want to help other people to find the words and the stories and the messages to communicate their message, their the value that they can provide and to light up the darkness for their audience, right? I want to have that light that can illuminate the, the darkness, illuminate the path forward for the people who follow me. Mm. But at the same time, you know, in order to do that, uh, you need to be able to cut through the lies and you need to cut through the misinformation and you need to cut through mental blocks that we've created and all of these obstacles that are in the way. And there's not a better tool to do that than a lightsaber. <laughs> Love it. So I think it's the right tool for me. Um, and it's been the right tool for me for ever since I was a kid. Love it. And the last one, how do people find you? The best way to connect with me is through my website, andrewbrider.com. As we mentioned, you know, I send a daily email newsletter and I just share lessons that I've learned, stories that I find profound, um, ideas, tips and tricks to help people to create 
better content, to be more authentic in their content and to make more sales while they're doing it. Love it. Thank you so much for that. And thanks for being here. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us. Once again, I'm Marlena Semenza, photographer and visual strategist. Please comment, like, or share this episode. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss a thing. For more information on how I can help you create your iconic image, visit marlenasemenza.com.